about 301. I still think we have people coming in. So I'll give it one more minute and then we'll get started and I'll introduce Don. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, you can hear me. I know Don can hear me. That's good. Hope everyone else can hear me. A uh, reminder that this webinar will be recorded. And also, if you have questions for Don, he will be answering them after the webinar. Please put them in the Q&A and I will monitor them and make sure that we get to all of them. So how are things in sunny Florida, Don? Absolutely beautiful today. <laughs> Well, you are missing this incredible stretch of New Jersey weather for the past couple of weeks. The sun has been shining or hasn't been a rain cloud in the sky, um, which is great. I know everybody's grass is probably drying up, but we don't like to cut grass anyway. So this is our kind, this is our kind of weather and yet the humidity has been low. Uh, so for where I am, I'm in. Uh, I'm on the west side of New Jersey. It's the Delaware Valley kind of area. We have the humidity that that kind of rolls in and just like kind of lays there for the entire summer, which you know to us starts in May and doesn't end until November. So um, we've just really had a great stretch of weather. We've been we've been very lucky. So I think I'm gonna get started now because it's a few minutes af after, um, it's about three minutes after, and by the time I get done with Don's biography, which I have shortened a great deal, otherwise I'll talk for 20 minutes on his bio alone. Um, I think that uh, everyone who's gonna have lo wanna log in will have logged in. So uh, thanks for joining us today, everyone from around the state, and I think there may be a few people from out of state. Uh, I really appreciate your coming to the webinar on pandemics, ep epidemics, and infestations. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Don Byrne, um, uh, and then I want to tell you a little bit uh, about the uh, really about this this project in particular. And uh, you know, Don, Don is really recognized as uh, an expert on risk management and community resiliency. And I do a lot of work in community resiliency. So Don and I have partnered on a number of things, a number of projects for men, men, it's going on many years, Don. I don't even want to say several anymore, but um, it's going on many years. It's been a great partnership. Uh, Don's on the faculty of MIT and Boston University, where he teaches classes on crisis response and disaster recovery. And his clients include the American Red Cross, FEMA, and numerous other Fortune 100 companies. You know, I want to let you know that Don is a veteran. He's a graduate of the U.S. Army Chemical and Biological Warfare School. He holds degrees in mathematics, philosophy, and international marketing. And he's a contributing writer for a number of publications and, and news-oriented or, um, websites as well as being a great partner with the New Jersey State Library. Uh, so that's quite an incredible resume. And as you can see, Don is an expert in his field. And a little bit about uh, uh, this webinar. Uh, this is really what I would like to call an appendix, although it's more than an appendix. It's like another chapter of a project that Don did for us uh, several years ago after Hurricane Sandy called the Librarian's Community Resiliency um, uh, Toolkit and Disaster Preparedness Toolkit. And all of that is on our website for you to use free of charge. And what Don and I did, and especially Don, because his background is in emergency management, is really I kind of took a look at disaster preparedness planning as a whole in the library field uh, as it applied to special collections and um, realized that there was a whole other half missing and that was the side from emergency management. And emergency responders, emergency management, um, they work very differently than you work in your public library when it comes to disaster response. 
And what I wanted to do was sort of adapt the tools from emergency management and FEMA that they were using and apply them to the library field so that we could not only be better prepared and be, be better uh, re to respond to a crisis, but also that we would be able to work and seamlessly, more seamlessly with our emergency management in our local towns and regions. And so that was the whole purpose of the toolkit to write it from the emergency management perspective. And that's what Don did for us. And he did you know, an absolutely fabulous job with the guidebook. There's two parts of guidebook. Um, and then there's a workbook and it made it very easy to check off a list um, for you to do your preparedness planning. Well, the toolkit has been very successful. It's been around for a number of years now. It's been not only used in New Jersey, but it has been adopted nationally by many states. And Don and I have gone around and presented either in person or online to a number of states who wanted to adopt this method of using, taking tools from emergency management and applying them to disaster preparedness. So that's the background on the toolkit for you to use. Again, it's on our website under um, uh, library, uh, lifelong learning, disaster preparedness. And then COVID hit. And what we realized was that the toolkit that we did um, really did not apply to a pandemic. Uh, there was not uh, a lot of useful information for us to use in that toolkit when it came to a pandemic, when you had to isolate yourself, because the toolkit was really about how you're going to open your library, how you're going to help your community, the things that they need to bring them into the library. And, you know, you're not going to do in the pandemic, everybody had to stay home. So I know that New Jersey library, librarians and librarians really throughout the country, just as we always do, pivoted and adapted uh, to an online environment, to curbside delivery and all the other services that you've provided over the year. And now you're, you know, you've been reopening and all of that. And uh, there's been, you've shared, you very generously shared uh, what worked for you so that we could, we collectively have, as a field could put these best practices together for a pandemic. And I know that the State Library has a great site, um, not only under um, lifelong learning for uh, what to do in a pandemic, but also in our State Library Information Center, there's, an, there's a number of um, LibGuides that you know, give you best practices. But really the uh, American Library Association has the mega site uh, when it comes to uh, what to do during a pandemic, what policies you need to adapt, what you need to do for um, PPE and all those things. So that's sort of the mega site. Um, but that didn't stop us. I thought that we needed a pandemic um, uh, a chapter uh, that was added on to the, the toolkit and one that was not just COVID specific because everything so far, you know, has been dealing with COVID. Uh, there's some resources about the flu, uh, but I really wanted again um, to do something for from pandem about pandemics from the emergency management perspective. And so Don and I spoke again, and the result is what you have is the added on chapter to this pandemic uh, toolkit. So Don is gonna talk about that a little bit today, but he's gonna talk in general about pandemics and epidemics and all the things that are lying right below the surface because it's not just COVID that can come roaring back but we are always gonna be, we still are in a danger of having these things affect our lives and we always need to be uh, prepared for that. So with that long introduction to Don and about the resources that are available to you, I am gonna now turn it over to uh, our partner, my friend, Don Byrne, and really looking forward, Don, to your presentation. So, so take it away. I'm going to mute myself and I'm going to turn off my video and I will be looking for the questions uh, towards the end or uh, monitoring the Q&A as we go, uh, go along. So Dan, Don, thank you for being here and for doing this for us. Well, thank you, Michelle. And that was a very nice introduction. Thank you so, so very much for that. Uh, and let me say hello to some people who I suspect I've met 
because as Michelle pointed out, when we went around the state of New Jersey and did a large number of seminars as part of the um, Ports in a Storm uh, seminar series that uh, Michelle was instrumental in putting together, I had the opportunity to visit many of the libraries in New Jersey and meet many of the librarians. And by the way, congratulations on demonstrating that you folks are continuing to be a reliable and dependable cornerstone of your communities. You demonstrate the resiliency of continuing to provide services to those. Uh, you know, as we've discussed, if any of you were in our other seminars, <clears throat> you have the opportunity to provide services to some underserved populations and librarians are the most trusted public servant out there. So thank you for all the hard work. And I, and I know that for many of you people, uh, this is not a job, it's an advocation and uh, you take it very seriously. Uh, and as Michelle said, and uh, I don't need to repeat it, you know, the, the genesis of this came from looking at the question of how do we continue to grow and expand this body of knowledge that we've been able to uh, begin to assemble because I know that Michelle shares my belief that prevention and management really begins with understanding. And so what I'm going to try to cover in uh, our, our session today, or our time together today, is just to give you some background information so that you have a little better understanding of the um, various types of outbreaks that can occur they may be worldwide outbreaks, in which case they're pandemics, or they may be more limited. But there are many, many types. And honestly, as I went around and had the opportunity to meet not only librarians in the state of um, New Jersey, but in Arizona and in New York State and several other places that uh, I had, I was pleased to come and, and be part of a uh, presentation seminar series on, as well as at the uh, annual uh, ALA conference, uh, what came up was, you know, just a, a good sense of all of the day-to-day -day issues that you folks deal with, many of which uh, involve different kinds of outbreaks. So with that, I'll just uh, add my welcome to, uh, let me make sure I can advance this now, I took my hand off the mouse. So add my welcome to everybody. I'm speaking to you today from the uh, Eastern coast of uh, Florida on the Atlantic Ocean in what's called the Treasure Coast because of all of the treasure ships that have been unfortunately sunk or pirated in this area. This is the uh, area where you'll find the Mel Fisher Museum, the fellow who discovered and then began to recover much of the wealth of the Atosha, one of those uh, galleons that went down full of treasure and a, a very good and delightful place uh, as well. So we have good weather there in New Jersey and we're having great weather here in uh, Florida as well. All right, a um, little quick overview of what we're gonna to try to talk about. And we have uh, an agenda and we have a, an ambitious agenda to cover in not a lot of time. So I'm gonna to tend to move a little rapidly, uh, but call me back slow me down, ask questions towards the end. As with all of the presentations that um, I like to do, I like to begin with just an understanding of terminology. Let's get a common vocabulary between us so that there's uh, less misunderstanding. It's by no mistake that one of the earliest stories told in Western tradition is the Tower of Babel, uh, where um, the fragmentation of languages and a lack of understanding uh, that uh, emerged from that was one of the great dividers of mankind. So let's, let's come together and get a common understanding of some vocabulary, some concepts, uh, and some basics there. And then I just touch on a little bit of the history of pandemics and epidemics, because again, I, I want you to have a context in which to um, frame what we're facing today. And as Michelle points out, what you know, we will be facing in the future, this stuff isn't going away. Touch base on influenza, talk a little bit about how disease is spread. Uh, and I think that might be some helpful information when you get 
questions in your library when people come and ask you questions about, you know, should I continue to wear masks? Uh, what, what is the value or how, do, how does this work? How does it spread? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, touch briefly on the impact that diseases have had on us and then change from a, uh, a general statement and, and look very, very, very briefly at some of the other kinds of pandemics and epidemics that I know you folks face. Uh, I will reiterate what Michelle said. We've covered this in a little bit of detail in, 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 in hopefully some practical detail in the appendix that we produced. Um, with uh, Michelle's uh, uh, guidance and permission, I didn't spend a lot of time putting additional resources in there. You have all the resources you need on the New Jersey Library website. Um, and if not there, the ALA website has, has a vast amount of information. It would have been not a good use of time for me to try to duplicate any of that material. So that's all there. So when you see the appendix, you'll see we really refer you to those locations uh, to do a deep dive into really uh, getting more of the information, more detailed information. Okay, let's start with a concept. Uh, what we're really talking about here in general is an outbreak. And from a uh, standpoint of epidemiology, uh, an outbreak uh, is not limited to communicable diseases. It's probably the first thing we think about of communicable diseases, but an outbreak could be an outbreak of um, problems with, uh, that, that have a social aspect to them, civil unrest, um, an outbreak of uh, where I used to live in New Hampshire, opioids uh, taking over the city. Uh, we saw tremendous violence this past weekend in some of the largest cities, New York, Chicago, elsewhere. So whenever we have uh, an unusual and sudden increase uh, in, in an activity or, or a disruption, that's really what an outbreak is, is called. In fact, um, epidemiologists will tell you that uh, you can have as few as four cases of a rare disease occurring in a tight geography that would be considered an outbreak, it's, it's unusual. So outbreaks take many, many forms. And uh, I, I hope that you can think about that because some of what we put in guidance in the um, appendix that we developed uh, is really has a uh, usefulness above and beyond disease. For example, we, we go in there and we give you a reference to something that uh, police departments and uh, others around the United States and North America are now training in something called verbal judo, which is a uh, set of techniques to let you learn how to deal with people who are upset or are somewhat disruptive. Uh, I can tell you uh, from personal experience, this has been very successful. Uh, I have a, a colleague of mine who, believe it or not, trains uh, people who are volunteers at churches and synagogues and mosques. Uh, how to deal with uh, people who come in and who are distressed and become somewhat disruptive in a very nonviolent way. So, you know, any kind of disruption can be dealt with. And I just tell you that to give you a flavor for the, hopefully the rich um, resources that we've, we've built into the uh, appendix that, you know, will give you, uh, point you to a door, point you to an opening that you can then follow and uh, follow through to uh, get some more information on. I hope I'm not going too fast on myself here. Yes, okay. So uh, different types of outbreaks. An endemic, an endemic is something uh, that's really concentrated to a local area. We see these all the time. You get, you know, some little community has an outbreak of measles or You'll see that um, other communicable diseases like mumps will, will bubble up in a, in a relatively confined area. Um, that's what we're calling an endemic. If it spreads and becomes more widespread, it gets classified as an epidemic. And finally, if it goes to a very, very large regional, national, some cases as we have now, international basis, it becomes a pandemic. So those three are really speaking in some sense about the same uh, kind of activity, it's just the scale that it changes as we move from an endemic to an epidemic to a pandemic. 
Uh, the term infestation is one that uh, we will mention in here. Typically, infestations refer to uh, pests or vermin. Uh, you know, you'll have an infestation of ticks that carry Lyme disease. That's, that's a, more of an infestation than an epidemic uh, or a pandemic is how the, the phraseology, how the terminology is used. A couple of other concepts you've probably heard about. Uh, flattening the curve. Uh, we've heard Dr. Fauci on TV talk about this. You probably have your, your local health uh, officials talk about it. I know we speak about it down here where I live. There are two characteristics that define a flattened curve. Number one, when the number of people contracting the disease, new cases e erupting, matches the number of people who are being cured. Right, who, who are no longer uh, ill. So when you get a, a mix of those two, that's one of the two characteristics for flattening curve. The other one, which is the more difficult one and people tend to forget about is, and that the total number of people, the total number of cases that are being dealt with is within the range uh, of a population that your healthcare, your local healthcare system can handle. So if you had a hundred people becoming sick and 100 people being cured on any one day, but your hospitals only had the ability to handle 50 or 75 people, you would not be flattening the curve. You would have only one of the two key characteristics that go into flattening the curve. We refer to uh, COVID as a, uh, a virus-driven uh, disease. A virus is a very, very small, a submicroscopic infectious agent that carries RNA and DNA inside it and infects animals and plants. Uh, the RNA and DNA is actually encased in a coating or a cover, a membrane of protein, uh, and it penetrates the cell, uh, at which case it actually deposits uh, its RNA in the case of COVID. Uh, and the cells then uh, go on and they reproduce uh, as they reproduce, they actually reproduce the disease to cell. They, they replicate the RNA that's in there. Uh, you probably remember back, especially when we were talking about things like bird flu or swine flu, we had them classified using H and N words. Okay, so H is for, and I'm, I know I'm not going to get this right, uh, hemagglutin uh, proteins, of which there are 16 types, and N stands for uh, neuraminidast protein, so H and N. These are classifications that are used to classify the different kinds of viruses that are out there. Uh, and this is why we'll see that there are various versions of these that will emerge. So you'll hear about N1, H1, or uh, H5N1, or H3N2. It's the combination of these two different kinds of proteins that make up the virus. And that's where that terminology comes from. The uh, CDC has created five big categories for dealing with disease. Viruses, bacteria, parasites, worms, and then a catch-all for other, which includes fungus and prions and polluted water and spoiled food. And again, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to really expand your thinking to say, it's not just about viruses. There are many, many other causes that can create and lead to diseases. And you'll recognize these diseases if you look down the second column. So viruses, we're familiar with things like herpes and smallpox and influenza, bacteria, bubonic plague, cholera, tuberculosis, things we've, we've heard about for forever parasites, sleeping sickness, malaria, worms, guinea worms, tapeworms, and then other causes, um, fungus, uh, not a deadly one, athlete's foot, but, but can be very disruptive to people, uh, yeast infections, mad cow disease, prions that, that can get in and can uh, lead to a terrible illness, mad cow disease. Um, and then of course, polluted water, spoiled food leading to things like diarrhea and uh, food poisoning. Uh, and they're transmitted in different ways. The way they spread are different. And so it's important to understand, depending upon what you're dealing with, the medical professionals will come up with a, a way to intercept the and, and disrupt the transmission of a lot of these um, diseases. I will tell you that 
many of them and really all of the viruses can be interrupted through the simplest thing that we've been doing since the beginning of uh, time, which is social distancing. If we're not close to each other, then we really aren't able to infect each other with the viruses. Now that's not true if you're drinking polluted water or you're, you're, you're exposed to some place where there are other kinds of pests, you're walking through the grass and ticks get on your body. That social distancing doesn't deal with that, but social distancing for many of the things that we're dealing with, many of the dangers we face, is the easiest and actually the best preventative that's out there. Let me take a moment and talk a little bit about, um, give you a little perspective on, on the history of outbreaks. Diseases predate civilization, as you can well imagine. Perhaps the earliest disease we know of is Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Uh, it arose before plant or animal life about 2 billion years ago. But there are other diseases that have been around for a long time, tuberculosis, uh, pneumonia. Pneumonia is probably as old as creatures that, that had lungs to exist, malaria, rabies, smallpox. Um, I have some dates in here. These are not the dates at which we first think these diseases emerged. These are the dates that the historical writings of the time allowed us to identify and be able to differentiate the characteristics. So when they told us something of the symptoms that affected people, we could then say, oh, that was probably tuberculosis, or that was probably smallpox or leprosy. So that's what those dates stand from. So they don't represent these, these diseases have been around uh, since time immemorial. And a lot of the problems that humans have with diseases can be traced back to the development of agriculture about 12,000 years ago, 10,000 BCE. Because once we began developing agriculture, we began living closely together and we began to domesticate animals. And it was these two developments that allowed us to, we, we began ending our migratory nature, not traveling in small family units, we came together. Population densification took place, we began to live together more closely we didn't have that social distancing occurring and that gave the transmission uh, vector for diseases to move from animals to humans and then from humans to humans as well. Now eventually humans develop some natural immunities to uh, these diseases um, but they were localized and I think we're all aware of the fact that uh, when Europeans came to North America, uh, they brought with them some diseases that hadn't been seen before. The same is true of the um, explorations that took place in the uh, Pacific Islands. Uh, estimates are up to 95% of the indigenous people in North America eventually died from exposure to diseases carried by Europeans. Uh, very, very hard to come up with those statistics, but that at the high end, that's the high end number. That, that I've seen. And today we're still very vulnerable to first time exposure to diseases. Just think back to when Ebola came to North America or the outbreak of Zika and Zika began to migrate up uh, out of Brazil. Um, these diseases that were uh, really isolated uh, in uh, remote regions, people came into contact with each other, transportation, trade took place. That was the other major driving factor was not only agriculture, but trade is what really led to this exposure to come and uh, really led to the uh, creation of diseases that could travel around the world. What's interesting is that pandemics um, and diseases have actually had, in, I guess, an unintended positive influence on human evolution. I mentioned that uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, a uh, geneticist will tell us, is one of the uh, oldest diseases that we're aware of. Uh, we believe that the Rocky Mountain fever uh, may be the source of the development of myochondria, which is the um, part of the human cell that generates energy and so our ability to move about and, and grow and develop uh, 
as a multi-celled organism and eventually evolving into humans um, was actually, we believe, a side effect of uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever infecting the earliest of the cells, plants and animal cells that were out there. Um, a theory advanced by the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine says that um, some other diseases, other pathogens, uh, may have been the cause of developing immunity to septus and uh, meningitis, which were uh, very uh, lethal diseases, especially leading to uh, deaths in human fetuses. fetuses. So, uh, you know, growing children, um, we began developing a, an immunity to these uh, diseases early on, and it allowed our uh, species to uh, develop and grow. So, uh, this has happened over time, and it's it's interesting to realize, you know, we go hand in hand with diseases. We we walk down the road of life with them, and so that's why it's so important, as I mentioned in the beginning, for you to understand something about the various kinds of diseases that we face, because that knowledge will equip you better to deal with the issues that uh, that may come. Uh, just even in today's world, uh, if you look at some of the very early statistics and they're still collecting them, uh, look at the unintended side effect of uh, the response we've all had to COVID-19. It seems that influenza, the common cold, the, the, the normal flu that we would get is way down and the number of deaths that's attributed to it is, is way down. Why? Because of the steps we've taken to enforce social distancing, uh, and improved uh, sanitary habits on the part of many, many people. So again, an, an unintended consequence of a, a pandemic outbreak. But they are mostly negative, right? I don't wanna paint a, a great picture for pandemics. And I'm not gonna go through all of these. You, you've seen these before. Uh, we certainly uh, have had a lot of uh, information available, some really, uh, very good books have been written about the uh, Spanish flu and, and the outbreak and killed 50 million people. Uh, and by the way, you'll see that some of these diseases that we have here that we're looking at uh, are ones that actually have survived and they began in prehistory. So things like tuberculosis and leprosy and smallpox and measles, they're diseases that endure they endure over hundreds and thousands of years. Got a couple of facts. I think you've probably uh, seen this photograph before. Uh, by the way, this is not someone sneezing. This is somebody speaking. So if you want to get a sense of what happens when people speak and why you're told to wear a mask, um, this is one of the reasons. This is naturally the, the particles that just in regular speech that uh, come out of each of us when we speak to each other. And so being distanced away from each other and having a mask on uh, helps deal with, uh, with these issues. So uh, from a standpoint of the most common or the, the type of uh, disease that we're probably most familiar with, uh, influenza, the flu, there are three types of flu, A, B, and C. C is generally not dangerous to humans. It can make you a little sick, but its, it's effects are generally very modest. Um, it's types A and types B that we have to worry about. And type A is the one that is most prone to uh, mutations. Uh, when you get a flu shot, flu shots are generally designed to protect you against four different types of uh, influenza viruses, two forms of virus A and two forms of virus B. Uh, and that's why uh, you really, it, it, it is almost a social responsibility to get vaccinated every year uh, because you really do help cut down on the opportunities. Now, I know that a lot of this, you know, the type of influenza that they develop the viruses for is based on a forecast, what they think will be uh, the most likely ones to break out. Uh, and sometimes the experts uh, guess wrong 
but in many cases they guess right. And over time, uh, there is a cumulative effect, a positive effect on you and on your community. So really, um, when you have the opportunity, it, uh, you know, I personally think it's part of your social responsibility to go ahead and get your annual uh, vaccination. Now, how does how do viruses spread? How does influenza spread? Um, and how does COVID spread? So we have here um, an example of what the COVID uh, virus looks like. It has these little red spikes, as they're called, on them. What happens is that when COVID enters your body, it gets into your respiratory system. The cells in your body try to surround it and try to en encapsulate it. What COVID does is it uses these little spikes and it grabs hold of the cells that are surrounding it and it tries to bond itself closely to those cells. And it tries to bring its membrane in contact with the membrane of the cells in your lungs. Once it's done that, then it can tunnel in. It can, it can break into your cell, it can tunnel in. And that's when it deposits its um, RNA strands in there, which are the, the things that make you sick. Um, and once that's done, then your cells begin to reproduce. And when they reproduce, they reproduce these um, eight RNA strands that uh, have been spread by the uh, COVID virus. And that's why the, the approach we've heard about mRNA uh, as being the technology that's being used uh, with some of the viruses that are coming out, I'm sorry, some of the vaccines that are coming out. Um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to teach ourselves how to resist uh, these and, and, and deal with these spikes um, these protein spikes that are coming out of the viruses. And that's why there's so much excitement because what will work for COVID virus may have applicability to work with many, many types of viruses that follow the same pattern of trying to hook on to our cells and penetrate us in that way. If we can teach our bodies to deal with it, then there's great hope that many diseases uh, eventually may be solved using the same approach to... Um, preventing transmission. Another term you've probably heard is R0 or R sub zero. They, they call it R0. Um, it's a mathematical term that's used to um, describe how infectious someone is. It's a measure of what's called the reproduction number. How quickly can one person infect another person? So if R0 equals 18, that means you can expect that if you have a population that has not been vaccinated, one individual can infect up to 18 other people. The Spanish flu only had an infection rate of 1.4 to 1.6, but we had no defense against it. And so it spread. Now, anything above one, you're getting a geometric increase in the number of uh, cases that develop and that's why eventually 50 million people lost their lives to this to this terrible disease uh, we're not sure we've taken different readings on covid 19 the r naught number seems to be anywhere at a, a low of 2.2 up to a high of 5.7 so somewhere in the middle pick a number in the middle three and a half four uh two and a half something like that is the number of of cases that one individual who is infected can cause in other people who are not protected through a vaccine or other, other approach. Um, to illustrate this, I, I picked the 2.5 number and it just shows how one sick individual begins growing the population and how rapidly this can pass through your community. Uh, this is some complicated um, mathematics that goes into this, but um, to flatten the curve, what the epidemiologists say is, uh, we need to achieve an 82% vaccination rate if we want to flatten the curve in North America against this particular virus. So if people are, are saying to you, I'm not sure, is it really worth going and getting the vaccination? Yeah, it is. And again, I think it's part of that community responsibility that I, I mentioned before. By the way, if you want to see what um, the R0 numbers are for 
uh, some well-known diseases. Measles, 12 to 18 infections per person. Chicken pox, 10 to 12. Mumps, 10 to 12. This is why these are um, move so rapidly through population of uh, children. Uh, and then you can go all the way down and you can see that you can get down into uh, influenza, the 1918 strain again, anywhere in that range of you know, 1.4 up to maybe up to 2.8. Uh, the uh, influenza that hit us in 2009 was a, uh, was a tough one. Again, 1.4 to 1.6. Uh, Ebola, 1.5 to 1.9. So, um, and, and the incubation rates differ as well in terms of how long and how are they transmitted? Some of these are airborne. Uh, some of these are respiratory droplets that have to uh, fall on your body or you have to have a contact with bodily fluids, for example, with AIDS. Uh, big business impact, obviously. Uh, I don't need to tell you. We've all lived it. The International Monetary Fund thinks that the global economy shrunk by 4.4% in 2020, worst decline since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Um, the, the rebound that was forecast made the assumption that India and China would be able to lead us out of the malaise that we've fallen into. Unfortunately, as we know, uh, COVID is uh, widespread and is uh, just devastating the population in India. So that's going to throw off some of the guidelines about how long will it take us to achieve a recovery and, and what's going to happen. We also know that some countries don't have access to uh, as much vaccine as they need. And all of that, you know, put it all together, mix it all up, means that we're not at the end of this process. We still have a long way to go to get ourselves through the uh, the challenge that's ahead of us. Um, influenza, I, I mentioned before, we've seen a drop in influenza. Influenza is a, is a terrible disease and kills many people. Tends to, uh, it, it tends to uh, disproportionately affect the elderly or people who have a weakened immune system. Here are just some of the statistics from um, the, the past showing, talking about illnesses and medical visits and hospitalization. Um, by the way, the, uh, the statistics that we have here, are, they're reported from um, studies done by uh, healthcare companies, insurance companies report those statistics to us. Now, a little directly for you folks in uh, the library business and providing uh, services to your community. This gives you the sense of how long the virus, the COVID-19 virus, can survive on different types of surfaces. And I, I know this is why uh, some of the best practices that you've adopted is that when people check out books, you bring them in, you put them aside for four to five or six days before you're able to uh, recirculate them and uh, use that material to be uh, let out again. That, that's the reason why you're doing this, because of the ability of the COVID virus to live a relatively long period of time on different kinds of surfaces like metal and wood um, and uh, just even things like ceramics. So that's why some of these general guidelines about, you know, don't touch something and then touch your face because you may have picked up the virus and suddenly you're transmitting it to a place where it has a, a way of getting into your respiratory system. Uh, social distancing, again, continues to be the best thing that you can do and socially distance um, and from these different types of items that may have come into contact with other people who um, unintentionally may have deposited some COVID virus uh, on them and, and left them to survive. Uh, and just touch base on this, touch this very lightly. This is a, a model which I built, which I, I built in um, context of another question I was asked by a by an agency to say, you know, is there a way for us to look at our population of people and based on some characteristics, tell us which of our employees are most at risk? Um, and so what I did here was I said, what is the need for physical contact between your employee and the public? 
and what is your need for them to communicate. And so you take someone who has uh, effectively no need for physical contact, they, they, they can do their job without physically being near somebody, uh, and they don't need to really communicate closely with these individuals. They don't need to exchange materials. Anything that they can do will be done digitally. And so you take someone who's doing something like credit monitoring. Now that's different than a customer service rep who has a high need for communication, but still can be somewhat distanced. They don't, they don't have the need for that physical contact. Compare and contrast that with someone like a bank teller a nurse, a barber, uh, who have both a need for ongoing communication and an exchange of uh, items and information, as well as a need to be physically close to someone, cut your hair, uh, provide you with medical uh, services, uh, hand you money in a bank. Um, so you can think about the different people in your library, the different jobs that they do, and maybe this might be helpful for you to begin you know, mapping into one of these quadrants and just say, okay, uh, gee, uh, this group of people that are dealing with the public, we need to take special precautions with them. Whereas, you know, someone else who's a, perhaps a research librarian working from their home doesn't have the same level of exposure. So this is really a, a, a way of understanding and looking at those factors. So as I mentioned before, other viruses uh, also have this uh, spiky uh, element to them. Uh, and that's why we're, we're encouraged with the approach of the mRNA uh, vaccines to be able to teach our bodies to deal with and maybe get around and be able to overcome the, uh, the danger of these spiked appendages being able to pull our cells close together and then funnel themselves uh, into it. So uh, viruses do that. Uh, bacteria, we're, I think, all aware of, of uh, bacteria and why we want to make sure that we um, take proper sanitary precautions. Uh, the most is just, you know, five of the more common types of diseases from bacteria, the most, the, the, perhaps the most dangerous, bubonic plague. Bubonic, bubonic plague outbreaks of bubonic plague continue to today. It's, you know, in the United States, we still see bubonic plague in parts of New Mexico and on the Mexican border. Um, Pubonic plague has been around since, uh, you know, since the days of the Romans and the Greeks, uh, just continuously showing up. You knock it down in one place and it pops up in other locations. Uh, the transmission of that bacteria can come through food, through air, through insect bites, or just from touching other people. You can, you can spread it. Uh, we do have treatments for dealing with it, but the easiest thing is improved sanitation. And once again, social distancing. Parasites, I unfortunately, um, well, it was, it was interesting for me and an unfortunate for the, the people who were speaking to me, but I've spoken to uh, several libraries where they've told me about the outbreaks of bed bugs and other kinds of parasites that have, uh, in some cases, caused them to have to close down their library. So parasites, something to always be aware of something that will reoccur, something that will uh, come uh, to, uh, is a danger that we all face. Uh, they come from uh, bites of pests like tsetse flies and lice and other waterborne pests. Um, you can use antibiotics like quinine and other things in combination to fight them off. But again, sanitary precautions are the key. And that's why there are some third world countries where these are really, really these outbreaks are very, very virulent uh, and dangerous to people because they just don't have the, the technology and culturally they don't have the understanding that they need to, to do things like boil water before they, they take it. Um, worms uh, can get into people, come from swimming pools, uh, from eating raw food. Uh, unfortunate stories for those people like me who like sushi, you have to be thoughtful and careful about that. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that. Uh, and then different kinds of outbreaks, uh, as I mentioned before, from fungus or prions or different kinds of contaminated environments. So uh, that's what's in the appendix. Uh, in some more detail, we try to give you some more facts about uh, these different uh, topics. But again, all the number one thing that 
I tried to do was give you an awareness of these issues and really widen your perspective on what you should be thinking about and how you should view uh, a pandemic. Pandemics can take many, many forms. And as I mentioned in the very beginning of this presentation, they can take on a social nature as well. You have people who are feeling disaffected, they're feeling isolated. Uh, all of these things can uh, build on one another and uh, entire communities can be affected by this as we've, as we've seen. So um, continue, number one takeaway, continue your social distancing, continue to wear a mask, get vaccinated. And if people say it's not worth it, it's not the right thing, give them the facts, take the facts that I expose you to in here, share it with them, let them, let them then make an adult decision. And, uh, and I think they'll understand better. Getting that information and knowledge to people is the first step in really coming to control these diseases. So um, that's it. You can wake up the person next to you and I'll see if you have any questions. I'll be happy to try to answer them. I'm not an epidemiologist, but I'll see what I can do. Over to you, uh, Michelle. Hopefully I'm still yeah, I'm trying to unmute here. My mouse is not cooperating. Just give me a uh, sure one second. I'll turn back my audio again. There you go. There you are. Um, Don, thanks so much um, for uh, your presentation today and for showing us all those icky bugs and all that other <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, I don't you get know. I don't get invited to parties as it is. I know. Well, we what know I that they living. are living in places we would rather not we would rather not discuss. So um, I think I might have a question in the q and It says, do you recommend, yeah, there's a couple ones. Do you still recommend quarantining of books and other materials? And I think that somebody else said uh, that um, taking return books and putting them in a room for several days, does that help? So we're gonna talk about a little bit about quarantining materials. And I do know that there's been um, over the last month or so, there's been some new recommendations that, that have come out um, about, um, and we've and we've also discussed. I don't mean to take a question from you, Don. But please no, take it. In. You have more. You have more knowledge about. Well, we things. also have talked about this on our monthly directors and trustees check check-ins with Bob Keith. And um, so there's um, there's material there's information out there now that's saying that you don't have to you know do all the wiping down and the quarantining and all that you've done before, uh, mainly because you know this is kind of an air COVID sort of air airborne. Um, however, I would like to say that at the, at the state library we don't really we're not going to take a stance on that because uh, you're going to read different things in different places. Um, you're going to have to do what's comfortable for you at your library. Um, you know, a lot of people have all this PPE put in place and all these elaborate uh, cleaning mechanisms uh, in place where, you know, like you said, you're putting all this material aside for X amount of days. The best thing I can tell you to do is to do your own research on what's out, out there, check ALA, check the CDC. Uh, talk with your local and regional um, health officials and see what they recommend. And those are the recommendations that you want to follow. Uh, I don't think anyone can give you any kind of blanket statement on whether you should still be quarantining, you know, books and other materials or, you know, you should do it for four days instead of 10. You know, I don't think that we can tell you that. You have to really do, uh, uh, based on your research and based on what's going on locally, the recommendations you have to be comfortable with. I mean, frankly, I don't see any problem with still, you know, wiping down library materials because if it's not COVID, like Don has gone over, it's other sorts of viruses, other sorts of flu viruses, and, uh, you know, there's certainly nothing wrong with you, with you, you know, wiping everything down. Um, so I don't know, you know, Don, do you want to, in, gen in general, what I'm saying is they have to do their own research. We can't give them a blanket statement at the state library. Um, but Don, what are you, what are your thoughts on, on that? If you want to add anything. I, I actually, I do. And what I would say is, um, 
realize that we're still learning a lot about this disease. We don't have all the answers yet. And that there are uh, variants of it and uh, mutated uh, variants are coming. So the rules that apply today may not apply tomorrow. So I think the very best thing that you can do is some of the advice we gave when we started with um, the whole idea of in helping you folks uh, get a better understanding of uh, how you can play a role in emergency management. At those, in that time, we said, reach out and build a relationship with your local emergency management team. I would say do the same thing with your local healthcare people. Get to know people in your hospital. Get to know who your state epidemiologist is. Get on that mailing list. Reach out to, to those people because they're going to be the experts that will have the cutting edge information. And they're the ones that you can trust. So it's an opportunity to build a relationship that you need to have long term anyway. And I think that's a great answer. And I think that's one thing that's good about the pandemic uh, chapter is that we're talking about building new relationships and different rela relationships with different kinds of emergency responders. And that's, you know, your, the medical team and the health teams that are in your region, um, city, you know, town or, or state. We have um, some great statewide health organizations that you can make contacts with too. Um, so uh, just add those right to your repertoire of people that you need to partner with, particularly in terms of um, when it comes to a pandemic uh, epidemic situation. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I have another question here, Don. It says, what's your opinion of herd immunity? This is a typical response of people who don't believe in vaccination. My neighbor is a case in point. It seems to me that the concept of herd immunity does not protect the society, society's most vulnerable members, such as the elderly or immunocompromised individuals. Right, so that's exactly right. Um, first of all, it's, it's not clear what herd immunity really means to us here. We know that there have been experiments around the world, people like Sweden and some other countries that have uh, attempted to practice herd immunity. It was on again, off again in Great Britain for a while that they were trying to uh, see if they could do that. Uh, and you know we're familiar with this because we've all heard of uh, measles parties and uh, chicken pox parties where you take your children and get them exposed and try to get through that uh, early in life. Um, I think it's a dangerous game. Uh, you don't hear any of the professionals in the healthcare community recommending that as a technique to use. And the problem is not only is it that the most vulnerable people are at risk, you don't even realize who you might be exposing to, um, to these various diseases. So it, it really, it, it's much like I said before, I think it's a sense of, it, if you have a sense of community responsibility, I think you should view the question in that context. What, is, what does it cost you? What's the danger to you for taking a step to try to help protect your community and follow these guidelines? So again, have to, people have to make adult decisions for, the, for themselves, but you know. That can be a problem sometimes. Yeah, it can be. And <laughs> but, you, know, you, have, you have to listen to the experts. The experts will do. Say the best thing to do. You know, you gotta get that Fauci ouchy. Sorry. Yeah, you know, you, if, if they tell you when you're riding, if you're, you're driving on black ice, you know, steer into the into the into the turn. You should follow the advice of the experts who know what they're talking about. Don't decide. Oh, I'm just going to jam on the brakes. So. So we have another one that says, "Should we be concerned with the loosening of mask restrictions?" with the influx of new variants. I mean, I think just today there was something sent out that said, you know, bars and dance, you know, where you go dancing are all gonna be open in New Jersey again, I think without masks. So um, what are your thoughts on that? Should we be concerned with the loosening of mask restrictions with the influx of new variants? Well, so what's driving this to some degree is <clears throat> a feeling that people, need a return to a more normal, a, a previous normal lifestyle. And there are economic implications 
Uh, the state I love, live in, Florida, depends heavily on tourism, and the hospitality industry has been devastated. The large parks, Disney uh, and uh, Universal and others have been devastated. The, the thing that I have heard recently from the uh, medical professionals in this state is that you can loosen the restrictions a bit if you are outside in an area where there is a wide open uh, area with the wind blowing because we know that this is mostly um, an airborne and the danger is if you are indoors in an enclosed area, that's the issue to be aware of. But again, it comes down to, you know, what is your risk appetite? How much risk appetite do you have um, for these issues? Uh, again, we're, we're not sure. We, you know, we have the South African strain that has seemed to make its way into the U.S. There are other strains making their way into the U.S. What holds for one may or may not hold for others. Um, again, we don't have enough exposure to it. There seems to be some evidence that some of the vaccines give you protection against multiple strains, but we just don't know. And that, that's the problem. We're facing an unknown. We don't have good, good knowledge and evidence. And so, I mean, I'm going to be prudent and careful with, with my family. My father-in-law is 94 years old. You know, we, we'd love to go visit him. We're not going to do that. Not yet. Do you know, uh, just, uh, just because you're vaccinated, does that mean you don't have to wear a mask? No, you're told to continue to wear a mask. The vaccine is designed if, you know, what, if you speak to some medical professionals, I think what they will tell you is that uh, you can still contract COVID-19. It is less likely to be a severe case. We also don't know the uh, time period of effectiveness for the vaccine. Some people said it's as short as six months, and that's why you'll hear people uh, I believe the CEO of Pfizer saying the other day that they're thinking about giving people a booster shot uh, for people who got uh, the first set of doses. So again, th there's a lot of unknowns, a lot of uncertainty here. I don't see any other questions in the chat box and we're just about a little over an hour. So I'm gonna be respectful of people's time. But uh, I do want to thank you, Don, for coming on today. Thank you for doing the pandemic chapter of the toolkit for us. Again, that's already online uh, for um, you to use. So uh, for those of you listening, please feel free to go on and take a look at what a wonderful job uh, Don did with that, um, explaining everything. And um, I want to thank you, Don, for, again, another successful partnership. And coming on and doing this webinar for us. And I'm hoping that um, you and I can do continue to do some work together in the coming year as we continue to try to move the line forward um, with new material and new information that uh, for disaster preparedness uh, and in, in, in everything that that word entails. So uh, thanks for joining us today. The record, you will be sent a link to the recording um, it will be up on the State Library's YouTube channel as well. And so uh, I'd like to thank everybody and say goodbye at this point. Don, thank you very much and hope to speak with you soon. And regards to Melindy. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye, Thank everybody. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye.